Congrats. My name is Izzy Fuqua. I'm the adult programs coordinator for the VMFA, and I get to work with wonderful people like Colleen, uh, our assistant curator for the European Art and Melon Collections at the VMFA. She is going to present on the sporting art collection at VMFA. Uh, she actually gave this talk in person on Tuesday to a great group of people, and we're excited to bring it to you virtually today. We are presenting our monthly gallery programs, both in person and virtually. So however you can attend, we'd love to have you join. Uh, Colleen, I'll turn it over to you. All right. Thank you so much, Izzy. Appreciate it. So um, like Izzy said, my name is Colleen Yarger. I'm the Assistant Curator for European Art and the Mellon Collections here at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. And when Izzy approached me a couple months ago about participating in April's 3 and 30, she's like, you know, do you have a great idea to you know, sort of highlight some of the works that we have in the sporting art collection. And so I developed this talk um, about IDing horse idioms. So figures of speech, uh, many of us today do not own a horse, maybe have never ridden a horse, but our lives, especially our language and our vocabulary, there are so many figures of speech that come to us um, from these you know, more equestrian and equine dominated cultures. So I thought we would focus on a few works in the collection. It's going to be a little bit more than three, Izzy. I apologize, but I think we will get the point across. So let's look at something. So some of the idioms you may have heard in the past is, you know, a horse of another color or a different color. You may have heard the one to get off one's high horse or don't look a gift horse in the mouth, or horsepower, no sweat. How about you get back up on that horse? Chomping at the bit, free rein, hitting your stride, and hold your horses. So these are just, you know, a smattering of things that you may hear periodically, you know, in your lives. And so I thought we would highlight just a couple. So let's start off with, let's say an easy one where it's kind of obvious, hold your horses. Um, today, if someone says that to you, usually you know that to mean it's like, slow down, wait, wait before you proceed. So it's more like, let's consider other options. This is actually a figure of speech that derives from um, horse racing in Europe in the um, 19th century. And I apologize, I got that uh, dog tag wrong at the bottom. So I will edit that for you, Izzy, before I send it along. Um, but this particular painting is actually by James Pollard and it dates to, uh, let me look at my other side, 1830, 1831. And these horses are lining up for the St. Leger horse race. And as you can see here, there is no starting gate, which is something that is, you know, sort of ubiquitous in today's racing world. Um, up until the midpoint of the 20th century, horses in England actually lined up to race like this. So their jockeys would sort of walk them up to a predetermined line. And then when um, the starter would either, you know, drop the flag, you know, ding a bell or drop their arm. That's when these horses would sort of start flight. So this moment before the start of the race is literally when you hold your horse before they begin. And this was a, a moment that captured not only James Pollard, but also, and you're going to see where I got this, this inverted. Um, it also it fascinated artists like Sir Alfred James Munnings um, in the mid 20th century. And he did a whole series of images on this sort of lining the horses up, holding them steady until they're about to begin. So Moving on to maybe some slightly more complicated or obscure uh, figures of speech to get off one's high horse. This is normally um, used um, in speech to tell someone to maybe stop acting with such a superior air. And where does this you know, sort of come from? Well, it derives from these equestrian you know, centered cultures where the people who have the most money usually have the best modes of transportation. Um, kind of like today, you know, if you have more money, you may buy a more flashier car you know, as, as a decision. And when people see let's say a Lamborghini on a road, you know, or you see a Mustang, you know that is a car that has, you know, slightly more to it. And it's meant to be a little bit more flashier. 
horses was the same, you know, in earlier centuries. Um, if you, you know, had more wealth, if you had more money, you could spend more money on the type of horses that you rode. You could spend more money on their care. And these horses kind of become, you know, the embodiment and they exude many of the values that their riders do. And so I pull from the Mellon collections this sketch by Alfred de Drew of Napoleon, Emperor Napoleon III on horseback, which is in our collection. And the horse that the emperor is, is riding, this horse, you know, was meticulously groomed. Um, perfect conformation in terms of overall proportions, you know, just beautiful to look at and was glitzy and glamorous, you know, just like the rider. Now, if you have a high horse like this, you know, a horse that, you know, is just as, you know, above the rest like the rider, then there also implies that there's not so a high horse. And sometimes artists have a little bit of sense of humor with this. So for the opposite end of the spectrum, I pull in this George Moreland painting, uh, Paying the Ostler from 1792. And you can see that this particular horse um, does not look anything like the one that Emperor Napoleon III uh, was riding. Um, this particular horse is meant to be the exact antithesis of the type of horse that a highborn aristocrat would ride. And this is almost a caricature of just how opposite that type of horse is. And so to sort of give you a, an idea of the visual culture that Moreland is citing at this point in time, and just how commonplace something like this would have been seen by people and how they would have immediately recognized the humor um, behind it. We have prints in the Mellon collection that were donated by uh, Mr. Paul Mellon. And uh, Sawry Gilpin here uh, characterizes really the eight different types of horses that you can see in and around uh, Britain in the 18th century. And this is kind of a hierarchy, if you will. So the menage horse, which is the first print in the series, this is the type of mount that the aristocrats, that the royals would prefer to ride. These are the perfectly groomed, perfect confirmation, um, well-maintained uh, mounts that really give them that look of superiority, that gives them that look of control. Um, and so here you see a horse that is beautifully maintained. It has a groom who is taking care of its every limb and it is already saddled. It has its bridle on being ready, uh, ready to be ridden by its owner. Now, if we move down sort of the chain, the next uh, sort of most desirable horse in England, oops, Sorry, let's just uh, look at a comparison image. Here's another version of that menage horse uh, by George Stubbs. And we can do a detail so you can see just how similar um, these two figures are. But moving onward down sort of the hierarchy, next up is the racehorse, so the thoroughbred. And this horse may not be ridden by an aristocrat, but it definitely would have been owned um, by somebody who was incredibly wealthy in the 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries. And these horses look different than the menaged horse. This is a much uh, rakier, so taller, leaner, more fit. Um, these horses are built for speed and endurance. And so their overall look gives you that sense of athleticism. Um, and so we also have paintings in the Mellon collection where you can really see just how closely these sort of physical characteristics are repeated by artists. And it becomes part of this larger visual vocabulary that when somebody says to you a racehorse, this is what immediately springs to mind, this sort of taller, lankier, very athletic, raking looking animal. Now, moving on further, um, another type of horse that aristocrats, you know, well-born uh, people with some affluence 
probably owned in England in the 18th and 19th century, was a hunter, which is a horse dedicated to uh, fox hunting. And this is a horse that is built for speed, and it's also built for stamina, but it's also built to carry the weight of a normal person. So it has a considerable amount of strength um, also. So this horse is not as lean. It's not as you know slight framed as a thoroughbred. It may have some thoroughbred um, pedigree to it for the speed aspect, but by and large, this is gonna be a horse that can carry a rider, not a jockey, but a regular rider across country over all sorts of obstacles, you know, over a day's uh, fox hunting. Now, moving down, um, you see also road horses in art in England in the 18th and 19th century. And these horses, you know, are, not um, as perfect in terms of overall confirmation, but they are reliable and they are strong and they get the work done. Um, here is another example of a type of workhorse, this time a more sort of aristocratic uh, looking one in a very, very uh, Lorraine-esque landscape in the background. And then moving down, you have a coach horse. This is a horse that would have been hitched to, to some type of coach or gig or um, phaeton, some type of carriage and would have been uh, part of a team pulling. And then getting towards the, the sort of bottom, you have the dray horse, which is a horse that, you know, may have done more heavy lifting, you know, helping towards moving towards industrialization. And then at the bottom, sort of the last one that Sari Gilpin illustrates in this series of eight is the cart horse. And the cart horse isn't even positioned looking at us, it's looking away. So we get a full on view of the side of the animal with its ribs showing, it's sort of, you know, haphazard, you know, ripped blanket, sort of the yoke that is around its neck. Um, it's not very well groomed, its mane and tail have a lot of tangles and burrs in it. But this is your sort of stereotypical, uh, image of a cart horse in England in the eight, late 18th century. And you can see that once again, this type of visual imagery repeats itself. It is not just isolated in Gilpin's prints, but artists such as George Stubbs, again, you know, he did depict cart horses in, in some of his prints and in some of his paintings. And you can see, you know, you have the yoke, you know, you have sort of this not perfectly groomed mane and tail. You may see some ribs. Um, there is there are physical characteristics that indicate to the viewer that this is a, a cart horse. And here is just a closer detail so that you can see just one, how great a printmaker George Stubbs is, but it also you can make the, the comparison slightly more easily. So here is the entire series all together. But going back to our painting, um, looking at this mount that this aristocrat is, is riding, um, most closely, this horse that Moreland depicts captures the characteristics of a cart horse, um, right down to the mismatched uh, sort of tack, um, the sort of very you know heavy duty bridle. Um, this is more of the menage bridle. So the type of bridle that you would have seen on the very first horse in the print series, where you have the double bits and you have the multiple reins because this comes out of like, um, battle where you'd have to give very subtle directions to your horse as the rider so that you know you would not be in the line of fire. Now this rider you know who is at this inn you know he was expecting um, a mount that looked a little bit more illustrious a little bit more put together than this and you can tell from his facial expression he's kind of miffed that he got this particular horse to ride. Um, but at these inns and sort of why would, you know, this aristocrat, this gentleman, you know, with his buckskin pants, his boots, his tailored coat, top hat and parasol, why would he be at an inn? 
in the late 18th century, you know, before you have trains taking people, conveying people from the city to the country, um, it was a multi-day ordeal to get from the city to the country. And so people would uh, break up this track by staying at inns. And if you didn't bring um, enough horses or a team of horses to take you from point A to point B, sometimes you could borrow a horse, you could lease a horse. And so this inn, this was was the horse that they had available for this nobleman to ride and he is anything but pleased that this is the type of horse that he has been given. And so um, moving onwards to another type of idiom that we see and hear sometimes uh, you know in art and in language is the idea of no sweat. And if there is no sweat, it implies that there is something that you do sweat um, with. And so this comes out of horse racing in England in the 18th and 19th century. Um, some of you may already know, um, and please allow me to repeat this uh, if you do, but if you don't, horse racing in the 18th century looked very different than horse racing today. The races were much longer. They were sometimes four to six miles in length. And it wouldn't just be something that was run once in a day. These were usually um, sequential. They were match races. And so horses could run two or three sets of these four to six mile distances in a day um, in order to win. And these courses were so long that these horses ran that it wasn't uncommon for spectators to also mount up and ride behind the horses that were actually running these match races. And so as you can imagine, horses are gonna build up quite a sweat running that amount of distance that many times. And when horses trained, um, and this is a great example of horse race horses in training. It is part of the Jordan and Thomas A. Saunders three collection that is on loan to VMFA right now. Um, horses, when they were training, they um, were they uh, their trainers put blankets on them to sort of facilitate sweating, which they thought would help them get fit uh, more fast. But as we know today. Um, horses, you know, when they do sweat, that is the way that they maintain their body temperature. Um, and horses, uh, the white that you see on their sides, on their flanks, you know, anywhere where the um, tack and the saddle touch them, um, this white stuff is actually called latherin. And because horses sweat so profusely and their coat is waterproof, um, the horse produces this latherin, which is a soapy-like su substance. It's a surfactant. And what this does is it um, breaks up the, um, the water tension, sort of the, the water, um, the tension of the water. So if you have a droplet, um, it stays a droplet. If you add soap to it, it becomes more of a puddle. So it becomes the, it allows the water surface tension to make that drop of water become more puddle-like on the horse. So it allows the water to sort of spread over all of the coat of the animal. And when it evaporates, that is how a horse cools. Now, if a horse does not have all of the sweat removed from them after they put in a heavy duty training session, um, that is when bad things can happen to their coat and the, the hair can kind of fall out. So especially when horses were in training and after racing, these rubbing down houses, which were located on racetracks, they were very popular. And these horses would be brought in after their coats were fully dry. They would be scrubbed, they could be washed, removing all of that excess latherin and sweat. So that way they could be clean um, and fit. Now in the Mellon collection, most of the paintings depict the horse sweat lists. So these horses put in these huge amounts of effort and you don't ever see just how much effort they put into it. Um, one painting that kind of defies this is Theodore Jericho's Mounted Jockey from circa 1821 to 22. And Jericho, you know, as a romantic artist and as an equestrian himself, 
he's very mindful of, of the effort that the mounts put in during a race. And so here he has likely depicted a horse just after a race has been completed. And you can see these white touches of paint that he has added here. Um, so he is literally conveying the labyrinth, sort of that soapy like substance that's conveying the water, the, the sweat to the surface of the animal. And you can see these areas of sheen and shine where that um, water is at the surface. And if you do a little research into horse sweat, um, if you do Google it, there have been many different studies that have been produced. Um, and there's a German study that says, um, you know, if the horse has some sweat under the saddle and the throat and has a little bit of foam around the corners of the saddle, um, that horse has probably lost one to 1.3 gallons of sweat after whatever it is that they have done. And you can go onward where it's like if just the flank and the girth and everything that we covered above is wet and there's now foam on the bridle and the noseband, 1.8 to approximately 2.3 gallons. And then as you go down further, if a horse has wet areas above the eyes and has foam sort of between their limbs, two to three gallons, so nine to 12 liters of sweat has been lost. And then at the very sort of extreme end, you know, if there's literally sweat dripping off of the horse, that horse has lost three to 4.7 gallons of, of liquid um, doing all of that physical exertion, which makes um, this horse uh, very sweaty and he put in a great effort. Um, so this was definitely not no sweat. And the last uh, idiom that I would like to bring in today um, is horsepower. So this is something that, you know, if we drive a car, we hear about it, um, but many of us may not know exactly what horsepower is. Um, and horsepower really became a thing during the ascendancy of the steam engine and the invention and sort of the mastering and the honing of uh, steam power in England over the course of the 18th and 19th centuries. And so here you see literal horsepower in the foreground and you see its mathematical equation being used in the train in the background. So where does horsepower come from? Horsepower, uh, we can sort of, you know, look back and give a very big nod and a lot of credit to James Watt, who was a Scottish engineer, who from childhood, and um, prints were made to, to sort of commemorate this apocryphal sort of tale, that this young kid um, who was supposedly very sickly, but very interested in the sciences, turned his mother's teapot into uh, a place of experimentation for steam. And it's during these, you know, sort of experiments with mom's teapot that he gets inspired to sort of figure out, you know, what type of engine can harness the power of steam the best. But even though he did the most to codify what horsepower would mean, he was not the one who invented the term. That term actually dates back even further to 1702 to this book called The Miner's Friend. And if you read a few pages of it, if you get to page 28, 29, and 30, um, what Thomas Savory is telling the reader is, you know, I don't think anyone reading this text would argue that water that comes over a fall or that comes down a river, we can harness the power of water with a wheel and make that wheel do work for us. And we can use that force to help us. Um, and so he goes, if we can figure out a way to get steam power to do the work of a horse or two horse or 10 horses, then that steam engine can do the work of 10 or 12 horsepower. And he goes, once again, if we can get an engine, which we do not have to feed, we do not have to shod, you know, so put horseshoes on, if we do not have to take care of it as, you know, diligently as a living creature, this is something that can greatly benefit society. And that's what he's talking about over the course of these pages is the benefit to having a mechanical steam engine. And so James Watt, you know, he's reading this, he understands this, and now he wants to try to, you know, 
make this easy to understand and convey to people. He wants to be able to sell engines that he has invented. So how to do that effectively so that everyone can understand. So what he does is he starts watching horses doing work and he starts to figure out an equation for computing horsepower. And so watching horses go in a circle around a mill, what Watt observed is that they can do this circle about 144 times an hour on average. So if we break that down into a minute, it's 2.4 times, 2.4 times around a minute. And then these horses are moving in a circle that is 24 feet in diameter or a radius of 12 feet. And then each of these horses is pulling with a force of 180 pounds to move the mill. So James Watt, you know, for every minute, he computed that if a horse does 2.4 laps of this circle, and then he gives the circumference, so two pi times the radius, and then using 180 pounds of force to move it, that approximates 33,000 pounds force per minute. And that he determined was one horsepower. But of course, it depends on the horse that you're looking at. There were some who looked at, you know, the force that a little Shetland pony, you know, could exert. And sometimes, you know, these horses, which usually served in mines, could, it was computed, you know, produce 22,000 pound force, you know, per minute. And then you have a horse like a Shire, which is the largest of the breed, you know, really a draft horse. Um, and, you know, where a Shetland pony is only about like 40 inches high at the withers. So at the shoulder, a Shire horse can be six feet tall at the shoulder. So that's a very different type of pounds force that that horse can exert. But James Watt on average said about 33,000. And because he was able to do that and put it in an equation that made mathematical sense to people, he was able to sell the idea of horse powered steam engines. And so with that, Izzy, thank you. And Thank I talked for more than 20 minutes. No, that's fine. It's a lot to take in. But um, I just first wanted to comment. I've never had quite so much math in a 3 and 30. And for that, um, I'm grateful um, that you can bring that in and show us that it all comes together, math and art. Um, but that's fascinating that that equation still exists in our vernacular today. Um, you yeah. know, horsepower engines. I think of the, the truck commercials. But you know um, what? If you think of math and art, isn't that what our, our kids' STEAM classes are? No pun intended. Exactly. Yes, <laughs> very good. Um, well, we did have um, one or two things come in. And of course, if anyone has something that comes to mind, please send it in the chat or the Q&A. Um, the first is not quite related to idioms, but um, just uh, someone acknowledged that um, in a couple of the images, the tails of the horses were very cropped and short. Could mm -hmm. you share why that is? Okay, so um, in prior centuries, um, before there is a real veterinary code of ethics, um, it was fashionable for horses tails to be ducked. Um, and so usually that would entail cutting through the, the vertebrae of the tailbone to shorten it. Mm -hmm. um, and it is not a painless, you know, it is a very painful, you know, procedure to do. Um, today it is, it is unethical to do it for a horse because a horse's tail is there for fly whisking purposes. Um, oh. But back in the 18th and 19th century, it was fashionable. It also made taking care of a horse, uh, you can imagine, much easier, um, especially if somebody had, you know, dozens of horses that they had to take care of, that this may have been something that was an investment. But you no, know, today it is a it, it's widely considered an unethical procedure to do. But that's a good mm -hmm. question. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Um, just while you have your PowerPoint up, would you mind flipping back to the image with the eight types of horses? That goes well with another yeah. question we received. Let's do it. You showed us so many different um, types to go along with these different idioms. And this question has to do with the Shire horse. So I'll wait for you okay. to get back to that. I'm working slide. on it. We're getting there. Oh, you're fine. This so one. 
you showed all these horses in different um, functionalities, right? Pulling yep. carriages, um, being mm -hmm. ridden by a single rider, that sort of thing. The question yep. is about the Shire horse. What was the purpose of a horse that large and with that much power? I mean, obviously it could be used for many different things, but mm -hmm. could you give us an idea? Okay. And this really gets um, a little bit, this may go in a little bit into the weeds just because of everything. The Shire breed really and I'd have to double check the breed specifications, but it's a relatively recent breed, like only in the past couple hundred years has it really sort of been uh, distilled. And the Shire horse and its sort of competitor, the Clydesdale, which if you've ever seen the Super Bowl, it's always like the Budweiser commercials, that's a Clydesdale. And I believe it was the Clydesdale that was a breed that was started in like Scotland and the Shire horse was the heavy draft horse for England. Mm -hmm. um, and so you have these two very big boned, very bulky, massive horses that are descended from the types of mounts that would carry you know, the full armored riders into battle. Um, and then as you get into the 18th century and as you get into the 19th century, you know, sort of like through selective breeding, these characteristics become more standardized. Mm -hmm. And so these breeds, um, you have some of the, the characteristics coming from like native English stock of horses, but then you have a lot of characteristics from draft horses from the continent, especially from like Flanders coming in and influencing, you know, sort of some of the aspects of, of a Shire horse. But that type of horse would really be used for like plowing. It would be really used for like these very heavy draft um, jobs. Um, no, no horse that you see here is nearly that strong. Um, so this is, you know, slightly before you're going to have like those horses, you know, becoming iconic uh, symbols of strength. Um, but it's, it's kind of a nod to the the history of the breed and its development and sort of, you know, its pedigree that, you know, if we, if I were to zoom to the end of the PowerPoint again, um, you know, it's like I had Field Marshal 5, that sculptor, that sculpture by Herbert Hazeltine, that was the king of England's, you know, mount. That was his, um, if he had to ride into battle, that would be the horse that would carry him there with the name Field Marshal to boot, which is kind of like, you know, it governs the battlefield. So the name kind of denotes the, the function of that horse, if it was to be used for that purpose. Yeah, a symbol of power um, yes. and strength. I can see that. Yeah, well, thank yeah. you. Of course. Um, maybe one more good one to go out on. Sure. Um, you showed us a lot from the Mellon collections, and we know they are beautifully redisplayed. Um, and just an idea, is it a variety of horses on view in the sporting art collection, or is there a concentrated one that we see a lot of? We know that Paul Mellon was the collector, so maybe he had a favorite that he liked to see in his collection. Just wondering if you can share a little bit on that. Okay, so like, let's, let's take sort of the Paul Mellon lens to, to really do it. Um, so as many of you know, the Mellon galleries have just recently, and when I say recently, it's in the last only six, seven months have they been reopened. They were closed for refurbishment. And so this was really the first major project that my boss, Dr. Sylvain Cordier, tackled when he, he came to, to VMFA. Um, and so when Sylvain was really looking at sort of the scope of the Mellon collection, um, and the Mellons gave thousands of works to the museum, we were the recipients of incredible generosity. Um, the paintings that we have, which can be on view uh, for you know longer periods of time, works on paper are a little bit more fragile. Um, Sylvan, you know, noticed that we had these huge pockets of concentration in terms of racehorses, and we also have a huge um, swath of paintings for hunting horses. And these were really two of Paul Mellon's most favorite pastimes. Um, his mom, Paul Mellon's mother, was from England and was, you know, a very avid fox huntress herself. And she really passed that love of like the English countryside and that lifestyle onto her son. And so Paul Mellon collected 
the art that really spoke to his own interests. And so the way that Sylvain has, you know, reconceived these galleries, it really sort of, they embody Paul Mellon in a way. So like the first gallery, it's portraits of horses. And Paul Mellon, if you read his autobiography, um, Reflections in a Silver Spoon, um, you know, Paul Mellon says, you know, it's like the majesty of horses always, you know, just captivated me from the time when I was a kid, you know, they've always been a part of my life and I love them and they're beautiful. So it's like that first gallery really gives you um, just the horse as the focus of a portrait. And that's a unique kind of take that we've never done before at the MFA. And this is, you know, truly something unique that Sylvain has brought to the collection is that, you know, to treat the, just the horse, which usually in equestrian portrait, sure when you have the person on the horse um, just to have the horse treated with the same amount of respect and with the same amount of detail as you would a human sitter you know that plays a strong role in Paul Mellon's collection so he has it from the start of that trope where it's the horse in profile all the markings can be seen through the centuries and then probably we have the largest um, area of our collection is the, the hunting imagery and sort of the countryside imagery. And so that takes up the biggest uh, melon gallery of the sequence of sporting. And then the last gallery we have, and we were able to um, put together in total horse racing images, not only from England, but also from France and America. And Sylvain was able to make the point that, you know, this is really international. You know, horse racing is, you know, kind of an international phenomena. All these different countries are talking to each other. They're going about it very differently. In America, you know, horse racing gets, you know, its high profile a lot from the knowledge of, you know, freed slaves and enslaved people who are the jockeys, who are the trainers, and who are the grooms, who are bringing just all of this knowledge to this field um, and making their names in it. So Sylvain, you know, very adept, in, you know, synthesized this huge collection and really made some powerful statements. So that's that's the bulk of what we have. And Sylvain got most of it on view. There's there's very few things that that just would not fit on the wall. Well, I think um, I can speak for anyone else who's seen the redisplay that if you're able to come to the museum and see it, highly recommend it. Um, yes. It kind of made, it made me see sporting art with whole new eyes. Um, and, and thank you, Colleen, for sharing this talk this morning um, and kind of realizing how much we utilize the horse in our um, everyday language. So uh, thank you, as always, for a wonderful talk. And thank you for um, attending, everybody.